Hey, welcome to the first webinar in the 2021 Landscaping with Virginia Natives webinar series. My name is Virginia Whitmer, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. In a moment, I will be introducing our speaker for tonight, Dr. Doug Ptolemy, renowned entomologist and author, whose recent book, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard, We'll have you out in your yard or at least wishing you could be first thing tomorrow morning. Doug has been an inspiration to me for many years and we are so pleased he is available to kick off our webinar series. Uh, but first I need to convey some acknowledgements and there is a little virtual housekeeping we need to pass along. The webinar series is being brought to you through the Plant Virginia Natives Marketing Partnership a collaborative and statewide initiative to increase the use and drive an increase in the availability of the beautiful variety of plants native to Virginia for their numerous ecological, economic, and aesthetic benefits. The Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program initiated and has been coordinating the partnership through grants from NOAA since the first, first regional native plant marketing campaign on Virginia's Eastern Shore was launched over a decade ago. Plant Virginia Natives now engages and connects over 150 local, regional, and state partners across the state. I want to call out a few for their role in making tonight's webinar possible. Our Zoom host, Blue Ridge Prism, especially Beth Mizell, and Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden, especially Phyllis Laslett and Megan Compton, who handled registration for our 2000 plus audience. Partners assisting tonight are Peggy Singleman with the Maimon Foundation, Margaret Fisher with the Plant Nova Natives Campaign, Anna Maria Johnson from the, Na the Natural Garden, and Emily Byers with Blue Ridge Prism. They will be helping Doug respond to as many of your questions as possible. Thanks also to the many Plant Virginia Natives partners who helped plan this event. And finally, thank you, our audience. As I mentioned, there is little housekeeping we need to keep in mind, which Beth will now go over. So I'm gonna turn that over to you, Beth. There we go. All right, thanks everyone. I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping things for Zoom. Um, if you're new to Zoom, um, some people uh, are, are old pros and some might be relatively new to the, to the technology. Um, so thanks to, for, to each of you for joining us today. And uh, we have over a thousand participants on the call today, about uh, 1300 actually. So, and that's an incredible response. This is a Zoom uh, webinar and each participant will be muted and there is, um, there's no participant video either. You can see us, but we cannot see you. Um, and you will not have the ability to unmute yourself. I think there were some questions that popped up in the chat about that. So I just wanted to briefly go through the slide that I have popped up on my screen. Um, so first, uh, we, we did have the chat box enabled, but um, we, we're gonna disable that for the rest of the, the session today. Um, and so we're gonna ask you to direct all of your questions to the Q&A box. And uh, if you look at the bottom of your window, you'll see um, your audio settings, the chat box, a raised hand feature, and the Q&A box. Uh, so if you click on that Q&A, it'll open a little a box for you and you can type your question there. Um, we're going to have some of your questions answered live um, and then we will save all the questions at the end for Doug uh, to answer Dr. Talme, excuse me. Um, so if you cannot find the Q&A, you can hover your cursor at the bottom of your Zoom window and it'll pop up and you'll click there to open it. And I just wanted to remind you that we have a really large audience and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. And then one final thing, uh, the raised hand feature is 
Um, it's operational during this session, but uh, we're going to ask people not to use the raise hand feature to ask a question. Please direct all of your questions uh, to the Q&A box and, and we will do the best that we can to answer them. Um, so I think that is all I wanted to, to say with um, Zoom housekeeping. So thank you, Virginia. Well, great, I'll thanks. sharing my screen, sure. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, so once again, I am so pleased we can bring Doug Ptolemy's empowering message and captivating life-changing photography to you tonight. Uh, in addition to being a prolific author of scientific publications as a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, Doug has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how these interactions determine the uh, diversity of animal communities. Doug also speaks eloquently to a public audience through his books. First, Bringing Nature Home, How, to, how Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens in 2007, which was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. Doug then co-authored The Living Landscape with Richard Dark in 2014. A bright lining in 2020 was Doug's book, Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller. This month, Doug is releasing a book about my favorite tree, The Nature of Oaks. Without further ado, I turn the mic and the screen over to Dr. Ptolemy. Thanks very much, Virginia. Boy, what a, what a way to spend a Friday night, huh? I'm going to tell you what my idea of nature's best hope is, but before I do that, I want to return to what happened last fall, not this fall, but a year ago fall. Um, up and down the East Coast, we had what we call an oak mast. All the members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time, and this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I stared at it, and I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole, stuck its head through, and then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze, made it look like the Pillsbury Doughboy, finally plopped down. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the ground. It takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what a weevil looks like. A lot of people think they have big noses, but uh, it's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. And they take those mouth parts and they chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg into that hole. And that's how the larva gets to the center of the acorn. Now, you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year like most insects? Well, it takes at red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they're out of the acorn, it leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives inside the vacated holes made by acorn weevils. And if they find a new hole, they're excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody, and the first thing they do is start moving the old colony into, or the colony into the new acorn. And they work very hard, uh, about 30 minutes to move that entire colony. And once they're in, they post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And they will stay there for the next two years until this acorn starts to fall apart. Well, about this time, my wife says, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? trying to tell you that that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise most of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and, and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of, of oak acorns. They take an acorn, they'll fly some distance up to two miles from the parent tree. Then they tap that acorn beneath the ground. The object is they're going to go get it during the wintertime and have something to eat but they forget where they, they buried an awful lot of those acorns. And a single jay can actually plant well over a thousand new oak trees every single fall. I learned this fall what is, what is really pollinating are witch hazels. Witch hazels, of course, uh, are, are bushy trees that uh, bloom well into the fall after the leaves have, have fallen. Um, frost, it's cold. And you know you read a book and it says, 
it's fungus gnats and flies that pollinate witch hazel. I have never seen a fungus gnat or a fly on witch hazel, but if you go out at night, this is what you might find. There are a group of moths called winter moths, several species, bicolored sallow is one of them, that also fly very late. And it turns out they are the primary pollinators of, of witch hazel. Now, I don't know whether, whether uh, bicolored sallows are flying late to take advantage of witch hazel or whether witch hazel is blooming late to take, care, take advantage of these winter moths. But at this point, they're both taking advantage of each other. You won't have pileated woodpeckers anywhere near you if you don't have a good supply of carpenter ants because that is what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the large trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That's the only pollen that that bee species can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them depend on the pollen of particular plant genera. So in, in our area, there are at least 13 species of, of native bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night long about the specialized interactions that are nature. But today, these interactions, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take advantage. We did not listen to what Teddy Roosevelt advised us a long time ago. In, 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon and he looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the creation of the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem, of course, is that leaving the country as it, as it was is no longer an option. We didn't do that. Uh, there's now only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, certainly. We've drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers or and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other such remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done that? Well, I imagine that we thought the earth was so big our nest was so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing pretty scary headlines at a regular clip these days. Like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. A third of our North American bird population gone. And now the UN says, uh, well, we're gonna lose a million species possibly in the next, next 20 years. And I love the way they report these, these headlines. Uh, they might as well say, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline as if it just doesn't matter. This is not an option, folks. It is not an option to watch life disappear from planet Earth. I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment and thus upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's talk briefly uh, again about this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, the great E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus, the most famous entomologist of all times, I'm sure, told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects. And he did it way back in 1987 in this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, it would change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystem so drastically that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fish, those, excuse me, those food webs would collapse and all of those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is uh, uh, bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. There is good news here and that is that doesn't have to happen. We could save our insects. 
We can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature. There is no way we're ever going to live independently from the natural world. And that's because we depend on what we call ecosystem services, the, the products of healthy ecosystem function. Here are some of the things that plants deliver for, we talk about for us, but it's for all the living things on the planet. How about oxygen? Pretty important. Clean water. Plants are cleaning our water, slowing its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. They're capturing carbon, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, taking the carbon from that molecule and building their tissues out of it, but then pumping the extra carbon into the ground, out of harm's way into the ground where it can be stored for, for tens of thousands of years. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Plants also build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather and lots of other things. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds, etc. So de designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just a really bad idea these days. It never was a great idea, but you know, we have 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. So, so taking huge areas of the earth and, and destroying the production of those services just doesn't make any sense. There have been visionaries through the ages uh, who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent, wrote extensively at the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the, the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups have been good at doing that, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies have been terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area. Then we go to another area and wreck that too. Well, I'll recognize that is not a sustainable relationship with the earth. So we had an idea that, that we uh, might even be able to develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all those things. But he dreamt that we could actually learn to do that gently without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called the land ethic. And he wrote about that in Sand County Almanac. What he didn't talk about was actually developing a land ethic where we actually lived. I don't, I don't know why, uh, but I suspect that the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, and it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. Well, tonight I want to argue that, that living with nature not only is an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature or actually re reconstitute it, rebuild it where we've taken it apart, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we need to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's go back to private property because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned, about 75% of the entire country privately owned. If we didn't do conservation on private land, we're going to fail because we'd be working on, on far too small uh, uh, area to actually succeed. But there are a lot of areas that we don't seem to, we, we don't typically think of as options for conservation that could be. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? There's 21 million acres in, in those rights of ways. Railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. You know, the Denver airport is, is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big areas. 17 million acres of roadsides in this, this country. And then we have all the places where we live. Rural areas, suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those types of landscapes. If you add up just these, and you can think of other places, that's 599 million acres that could be used for conservation that right now is not being used in any effective way. How big is that? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, plus Virginia, plus New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, even Texas. Not having an area, a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation just about anywhere. 
Now, when I talk about doing conservation, I'm really talking about rebuilding the natural world. Will it be exactly what was in, in a particular place hundreds of years ago? No, it won't. But we can still reassemble those specialized relationships that are nature uh, and, and form functioning ecosystems again. There are some species that are a lot more important in ecosystems than other species. So we have to start with them. I call them building blocks. Uh, and then other species depend on them. And there, there are at least two groups that we have to think about. We have those flowering plants, you know, vitally important, but you're not going to have the flowering plants unless you have the pollinators that allow those flowering plants to reproduce. So we need the, the plant pollinator complex, but that allows uh, food to be, to be captured from the sun and uh, created in the leaves of plants through photosynthesis. But if we don't get that food from plant leaves to animals, it's, it's locked up there. It might, might as well not have been produced. Well, most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. And it turns out that, that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars, most of the energy that plants capture is locked up in the leaves and you have a failed food web. In other words, you have very little biodiversity in an area and the, and the ecosystem won't function. Let me give you an example from Carolina chickadees because we've got a lot of data from Carolina chickadees. That is the chickadee that occurs in Virginia. Um, and you know that they're the chickadee at your feeder. They're eating seeds during the winter time, but 50% of their diet is seeds in the winter. The other 50% is insects, believe it or not. But when they are reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So they, they switched entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are, they are not exceptions. 96% of our birds uh, rear their young on insects. And most of those insects, it turns out, are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that. But this is a uh, citizen science study that my grad student, Ashley Kennedy, finished recently. And some of you may have participated in this. She put out a call to bird photographers to take pictures of birds as they were bringing food to the nest. And then the photographer is going to send the pictures to Ashley. Ashley would identify what the prey items were in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many birds uh, in North America as she could. Well, she got thousands of pictures and she was able to reconstruct the nestling diet of 20 of the common bird families in North America. And the, the green bars here are the percentage of those diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we built landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars to feed these birds. Most of the birds would be unable to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars we need to talk about. What do you think it is? There's actually several things special. And one of them is, uh, they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is uh, exoskeleton. It's cuticle made of chitin. It is undigestible. So the birds don't want a lot of it. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of, of injuring it. And if you've ever watched the parent bird rear its young, um, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And some of us smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're high in fat, high in protein, have a very low percentage of chitin compared to uh, other, other insects, most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like, like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. And beetles also have lots of sharp edges. And it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids um, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. And you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates. And vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. They have to get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have lots of carrots. Had some carrots today, as a matter of fact. To get my beta carotene, lots of tomatoes to get my lycopene, whatever that is to get my lutein. And she makes sure I have access to those things. And if I eat them, it stimulates my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a, a very healthy immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect uh, our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. 
carotenoids improve sperm vitality. They improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this, this male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutenes. And he makes pigments out of those lutenes, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he has, the more ladies he attracts. Well, where are they getting their, their carotenoids from? They're getting them from, of course, the prey items that they're eating. Um, but carotenoid levels are not equal across vertebrate prey, invertebrate prey items. These first two bars are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of prey items. The third bar here is orthopteroids, things like crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids. Here's uh, the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have uh, far fewer carotenoids than the caterpillars because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way over here. The earthworm, um, the, the early bird might get the earthworm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets, gets the worm. Does carotenoid content influence the way birds hunt for prey, particularly when they're feeding their young? Well, Ashley did another study with bluebirds. She got GoPro cameras and put them on the rooftops of bluebird houses. And those cameras took a picture once every second. And the object was to get a picture of the bluebirds as they were flying into the house with prey. And she had a lot of GoPro cameras and a lot of bluebird houses, and she did it for three years. So she had over a million pictures to go through. But out of the million pictures, she got 7,628 that were good enough that she could identify the prey item. And it turns out that uh, we've got a very nice relationship. Caterpillars are brought back more than anything else, but they also have the highest level of carotenoids, followed by those orthopteroids that have the next highest level of carotenoids. And then everybody else that doesn't have much in the way of carotenoids uh, was nestled way down here. Uh, so it does, yes, it does suggest that carotenoid level might be one of the factors birds are looking for. But what it really suggests is that if we put all this information together, caterpillars may not be optional parts of bird diets. It's looking like they are essential parts of bird diets. So the next question is, how many caterpillars do birds need? Uh, is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? That is a good question. So let's go back to chickadees because there are a lot of data for chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around. So nobody's been able to, to count that. Uh, so it takes tens of thousands of caterpillars to create a bird that is a third of an ounce. And if you want chickadees to be, be uh, breeding in your yard, and we do want them to breed in our yards because that's pretty much all that's left in so many places, you have to have all those cater caterpillars in your yard because the birds are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. They forage about 50 meters from the nest. And if we landscape in a way that does not create all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And there's more and more evidence that that is directly linked to the bird declines that we're measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years and divided those birds into two groups. The terrestrial birds that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the birds that do not require insects, things like uh, doves and finches that can actually reproduce on seeds. They gained some numbers, but the birds that require insects on average lost 10 million individuals per species over the last 50 years. Now, this doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that there is a tight relationship between the, the uh, quantity of caterpillars and insects that are out there and the health of our bird populations. So uh, in, in, in the language of COVID, in an abundance of caution, I think we need to start creating landscapes that have a lot of caterpillars, which of course is a very different goal from landscaping uh, the way we've done it in the past. In the past, we viewed our plants simply as decorations and we didn't want anything to eat them. So we had uh, landscapes with no insects, which meant there was no food web there. All right, if we're gonna change, change that uh, goal and actually build landscapes with caterpillars, how do we do that? Well, you add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that support them. There is a catch though, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars, which means we have to add the right plants. We have to be fussy about which plants we add. And we have to be fussy about which plants we add because the insects that eat plants, the caterpillars that eat those plants are very fussy. And the monarch butterfly illustrates it as well as anything else. 
you can have all the all the calorie pear and all the camellias and crepe myrtles and boxwoods and and burning bushes and barberries that you want in your yard all of the ornamentals from asia and you're not going to create a single new monarch butterfly the only thing that's going to create them is their host plant milkweeds and monarchs aren't special that's called host plant specialization and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists why because plants have made them that way plants don't want to be eaten they want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction so they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic and it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world and that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants, cannot eat most of the plants because they are too well protected. And if you don't believe me, Nick, this spring, this summer, go out and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not going to like it. There's a reason it's very hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. That's my little joke. But this is not a joke. Um, insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses that are in all the plants? Well, that's where the specialization comes in. Each plant lineage that's out there has a unique cocktail of chemical defenses protecting it. Well, a, an insect species can't adapt to all of them. So it picks one or two that are very similar uh, in their, their defenses. And it develops the, the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. All these specialized adaptations that allow them to eat those plant lineages without dying. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history for all those adaptations to fall into place. And because they focus on one or two plant lineages, they don't develop adaptations for any of the others. So they are locked in to eating those plants. And if you don't believe me, try to raise a monarch butterfly on, on uh, crepe myrtle. See how that goes. It's not going to work out very well. And this is why our native insects are very poor at eating all of the plants we bring in from other continents. Okay, those plants have not been here nearly long enough for any of our insects to adapt to them. All I'm trying to say is that plant choice matters, folks. If we're trying to, to rebuild the food webs that support the life around us so that we have functional ecosystems, we have to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when you do choose those plants. Um, and starting, I'm going to start with, with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting in this window right, right here. Uh, we we uh, bought a property on uh, a farm that was broken up and sold 10 acre lots. And it was a very old farm, had been farmed for uh, uh, just about 300 years. The soil was exhausted. The last thing they did was mow the area for hay. But um, when in our, our area, when you mow for hay, what you're really mowing are all the rootstocks of all those invasive species from Asia. Uh, autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and privet and all those things. You mow that and then you call that hay. Uh, and it's okay because they sell it to the mushroom industry. But of course, when we started to build the house, they stopped mowing and what came back was all of those, those Asian ornamentals. The rootstocks were not dead. Um, so the whole place looked like Sleeping Beauty's castle. This is uh, Cindy, and she's getting ready to clear the 10 acres. If you have a serious invasive species problem, don't give up, uh, because Cindy has proven you can get rid of it. Uh, she did most of the clearing by herself, uh, and yes, it's a lot of work. Fortunately, she enjoyed doing it. Uh, so we now have a, we have a property that is, that is cleared. What was I doing while Cindy was, was uh, working so hard? I was telling her she was doing a great job, but I also was putting plants back and I tried to choose those plants strategically. Now I have a little hobby of taking pictures of caterpillars. So I wanted to see if I could bring caterpillars to our property that I'd never seen before. For starters, like the Canadian Allet, I'd never seen a Canadian Allet. Uh, and that's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. We're well, not gonna have Canadian Allets unless you put their host plant there, which is meadow row. Uh, and there, we had no meadow row. There's no meadow root anywhere around us that I know of. The whole area was farmed to death for hundreds of years. I'm sure it was here hundreds of years ago. But so I got some meadow root from someplace else, planted the seeds. It grew really well. Um, but I did not go out and check my meadow root uh, planting because I didn't dream the Canadian outlets would find this very quickly. I thought it might be years, if ever. 
Well, after a month and a half, I finally do, did walk by and uh, it was practically defoliated by Canadian owlets. They had found it right away. I was amazed. Uh, well, now we have a good population of metaroo and Canadian owlets. So we've added two species to the property. The object is to rebuild the biodiversity by putting the plants back. Worked well with the goldenrod stowaway again. That's a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some Biden's uh, Aristosa in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got the seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. We had to wait a year for the moth to come, but it did come and now we've, we've got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species to the property. I wanted Hackberry Emperor because it's a butterfly that should be here. And I wanted it not because it's the prettiest butterfly, it's just a butterfly that should be here. But as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry. We didn't have any Hackberry. So I planted Hackberry. We had to wait four years for these butterflies to find our Hackberry, but they did find it. I walked by one of my Hackberry trees this June uh, and on single branch, there were nine Hackberry Emperor butterfly caterpillars. So another big success. So we've added six species and that's, that's how it goes. Um, I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own and along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is the goldenrod flower moth. It has not come yet. So this is anticipation. That's what the caterpillars look like. This is like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I look for these caterpillars, hoping I'm going to find the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I will, and that'll be a great day. I also planted Virginia creeper um, because it's a great host plant. I don't know why people don't like Virginia creeper. It's a good ground cover. It climbs our, our trees without strangling them, without girdling them. Um, and it's a major uh, host plant for an awful lot of caterpillars, particularly the large sphinx moths that are the primary food for cardinals when they're reproducing. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Uh, I wanted to see if I could attract the zebra swallowtail. Now we're at the northern limit of zebra swallowtails in the east here. As a matter of fact, the closest population I know of is 26 miles south of us. They're pawpaw specialists, so we planted pawpaw um, and we did have to wait. We had to wait nine years for the zebra swallowtails to go over that 26 miles, but they finally did and we got our zebra swallowtails. In the meantime, we got uh, the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx. And we're getting lots of pawpaws every year. I wanted to see if I could attract the double tooth prominent just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. It of course is a specialist on um, elms. So I planted American elm, caterpillar came right away. I wanted the, the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. So I planted evening primrose and it came as well. And the adults spend the day with their heads stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the plants we've put back on our property, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. And people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And you know, I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, if it has to be 400 years old for you to enjoy it, that you're correct. But you can enjoy what the oak is doing and you can enjoy that right away. And I, I'll tell you that from experience because I planted my oaks as acorns, most of them, a few of them as, as two foot bare root whips. And right away, they started to attract the, particularly the moths that run the, the, the food webs that support the ecosystems of my yard. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner came right away, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the orange-headed epicolema, the red-washed caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property including the Bernie meme caterpillar, which you can get in the wintertime because they wear gloves and they come right away. This is a pin, pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves here. And here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating the leaves of that, that pin oak. So you don't have to wait centuries for your oaks start to contribute to your yard and for you to appreciate all that they're delivering to your ecosystem. 
this is what our house looks like, uh, will look like in a few weeks, but um, I'm still sitting in this window right here. I show you this just to convince you we've got some lawn here. We're very traditional, but we put plants back. And I noticed a long time ago, every time I put a new plant lineage uh, in our house, we got new species of moss. And four years ago, I made it a goal to start to take photographs of every species of moth on a property that I could, I could find. I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,031 species of moss on our 10 acres. Now, Pennsylvania is uh, 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area, we have 40% of all the moths that occur in Pennsylvania. And because most of these are types of bird foods, we have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, which is 38% of all the terrestrial birds in Pennsylvania. I'm telling you this because it works. We saw this headline this fall, World Wildlife Fund says we lost two thirds of, of Earth's wildlife since 1970. Uh, I'm thinking not at our house. I, I, I'm sure we have increased biodiversity at our house by more than two thirds and other people can do that too. These are, these are frightening headlines, but we don't have to just sit here and wring our hands. We can put the plants back and life will return. But I know what you're thinking. We have 10 acres. A lot of people don't, they're in a small suburban lot. Will it work in suburbia? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. Um, they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. The major invasive plant in, in Kirkwood, Missouri is, is Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was get rid of their bush honeysuckle. They planted a lot of native plants. Now they are, they are in suburbia. They're surrounded by, by their neighbors with the big lawns. Um, and they also put in a, something they call a, a bubbler. It's a little water feature that um, they put it in for the birds. And then they sat back and they started to count the birds that were using their yard. They're up to 149 species that have used their yard, including 35 warbler species. Now just to put that in perspective, um, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. And we've got, again, 18 times more, more land. So can you, you create a functional ecosystem on smaller, smaller lots? Yes, you can. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because right on the other side of this wall is one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. And she is not connected to any type of a natural area. She's a little island in Chicago. But she did the same thing. She took out her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a little water feature for her birds. And she sat back and started to count the birds that are using her property. And she's up to 117 species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. But what about city centers? You know, 82% of us are said to live in cities right now. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant. Asclepias tuberosa, people call it butterfly weed, which reminds me we have a, a, a terrible marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed anymore. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. So I was staring at Monarch's Delight in 2014. And the first thing I saw were two species of megachylid bee, of, of leafcutter bees. I know they're leafcutter bees because they have pollen on their tummy, not on their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. And if those requirements are not met, they don't, they don't go to those areas. They need pollen, they need nectar, but they also need soft leaves like redbud, perfect, perfect for leafcutter bees because they snip out the edges of those leaves and leave these little semicircles and they roll up the, the thing they just snipped out and stuff it full of pollen uh, and then sew up the end and lay an egg in there. And that, that is where they, they rear their young. So here's, here are three pollen or, or yeah, pollen tubes created by megachylid bees. This is a picture by Heather Holm. And they usually stuff these in, in a crack or crevice. I often find them in the nozzles of my, uh, my uh, watering cans. So that's not good. Well, I think the, the, the uh, leafcutter bees were there because there was a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight. They had everything they needed. And I think because the red bud was there, that's, that explains why there were successful bumblebee colonies there. Remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens. So in the spring, uh, they, the queen has to do all the work. There are no workers. So she has to do all the foraging that starts the new colony. And she needs a, an abundant source of, of flowers and nectar. 
nectar and pollen. First thing in this season, and that's exactly what redbud supplies. So I'm pretty sure that's why there were, were uh, bumblebees there. And then I saw a monarch. This is all within about 20 minutes of each other. Actually, I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. 2014, I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. 2013 was the low point of the monarch population in the, the east. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. Um, why were they there? Because they had monarchs delight. I forgot to tell you, this was June too. Um, so June is very early for the monarchs to get this far, far north. But they were there because they had monarchs delight. And there was another milkweed there too. Um, I, it probably is purple milkweed. So they had forage, but they also had their host plant. They could lay their eggs and reproduce on those plants. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of New York City. And that's the strip of nature that we're talking about. There's the monarch's delight. 30 feet above the taxis. Um, this is, you know, middle of Manhattan, the construction. The High Line, if you haven't been there, is an elevated railroad. It was an abandoned railroad for um, a long time. But somebody went up and looked, and uh, there were a lot of native plants growing up there. So they decided to make it a tourist destination. Uh, and it's extremely successful. Literally, millions of people go to the High Line every, every year. That doesn't deter the, the uh, animals that are using this little strip of nature. This is Rick Dark. He was after me to go see the beautiful plantings on the High Line for years. Um, I'm not much of a city boy, so I, I dragged my feet. But, you know, going and seeing beautiful plants with nothing using them is actually depressing to me. And that's what I thought I would see on the High Line. What is possibly going to get to the middle of Manhattan uh, and make a living? But I was completely wrong. I saw all those things in just 20 minutes. Somebody's just finished a, a survey of the bees using the High Line. It's up to 30 species. Um, so to me, you know, it, it, I've changed my mind completely. If thoughtful native plantings can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, I think we can succeed anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about if we want to succeed in a big way. Uh, and one of them is we've got to shrink the area that's in lawn because we have too much lawn in, in this country. We've got over 40 million acres. That's the size of New England. And remember, we can't afford to waste parts of the earth anymore. Wasting all of New England on a status symbol just doesn't seem real, real smart these days. So I'm suggesting that we cut the area of lawn in half. We can still manicure it. We, there can be a portion that, that is you know, not a functional ecosystem, but we'll put important plants on the other half uh, and, and rebuild uh, much of the land that is out there. So when we, what we preserve, we will preserve our status symbol too. I mean, the neighbors won't throw us out because we're still going to be, be uh, we're going to have manicured lawn and follow the cultural rules. But we will have more plants in our, our yards. And if we replant half the area that is now in lawn, that'll give us 20 million more acres to use for conservation. And if we do this at home, we can create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest national park in, in the nation. And there'll be a number of immediate benefits we get by putting a park at home. You can rebuild or build for the first time a personal relationship with, with some part of the natural world. And you can do it at your own pace, your own time. Just go outside, right in your yard. You can avoid crowds. And if you go to a real national park, uh, millions of people are there with you. It's also free. There's no admission fee. It's also never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the, the pike, you're always able to go out in your yard. No travel hassles. But here's the big one. You get to experience the natural world alone. I don't know how you're going to develop that personal relationship if you're not alone. We can, you can focus on the nature that you're, you're looking at. And this is critically important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, According to Richard Louvre, we, want, we got to expose our kids to nature. So, you know, we put 30 of them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour and they walk around a natural area for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. They get back in the bus and they go home. And I'm sure that's better than nothing. But let's face it, what they really had an experience with is 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If there's a park right in their yard, they can go outside and discover it alone. No parental supervision. 
trial and error. Let them figure it out by themselves. It's critically important to developing that, that personal relationship with nature because our kids are the future stewards of the planet. If they don't know what they're stewarding or why they're stewarding it, they're going to be lousy stewards. Don't worry. Most of them will make it back alive. And they might learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning that from my, my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Alaska. Alaska. Hawaii. Why did I say Alaska? She lives in Hawaii on a very small patch of nature. And it's not all that natural. It's grass and a hedge. But uh, there are uh, no lizards there. And she sent me this picture to show me how you hunt those lizards. You get on the ground and you disguise yourself with sticks and leaves so the lizards don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business here. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put them in an aquarium and you've got a personal relationship with that little piece of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be uh, hunting lizards on the ground in her best dress the rest of her life. I don't think, uh, but I guarantee she's gonna remember doing this uh, on her little patch of nature in, in Hawaii the rest of her life. Uh, and I also guarantee she's gonna be a good steward of the planet when she grows up. If you want your kids to do more than, than hunt lizards, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world right in your yard. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, uh, it doesn't cost anything. Go to uh, our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and get yourself on the map. The object is to follow the directions for, for um, giving us your location and the amount of area that you are converting to, uh, to natives that are going to support the food web or if you already have an area you've, you've converted that's fine if you're protecting an area that's great we just want to get all that information on the map your the your little piece of the world in your county is going to light up we can have counties competing against each other the object is is to is to record the replanting of those 20 million acres i was talking about but when i think about it, if we really do get to 20 million acres let's not stop there, stop there let's do the whole country we can do that and you can even get a little little sign that says you belong to Homegrown National Park. And no, we're not using your data for anything. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. Um, what plants are we going to put in the area that's now now lawn? Well, some of them. I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember the Roman arch? The stone in the middle of the arch is the keystone. And if you take the keystone out, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. That's how important they are. They're essential. It has, they have to be there. We have found out that just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% are making 90% uh, of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. These are like these keystone plants are like the two by fours when you're building a house. The house is not going to stand up without them. You can't build your house out of wallpaper um, or out of out of sheetrock. So it doesn't mean that's the only thing the house is built out of. But these these plants are essential if you're going to have a functioning food web. So the question is no longer simply are natives better than, than non-natives. On average, they certainly are in terms of supporting wildlife. But the question really is, do we want the most productive plants, ecologically productive plants we can get in our yards? or benign plants, or even worse, the ecologically destructive plants, those invasive species, those invasive ornamentals that don't stay in our yard and biologically pollute, ecologically castrate all of the land around us. I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago? That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not our metric anymore. It's not whether a plant is native or not. It's whether it's productive or not. What is it doing? I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They produce zero species of caterpillars. There are two rare records of, of something nibbling on there, but you're never going to find them. I've never seen them. What is producing the food in our food webs? Well, in 84% in of the counties of North America, oaks are number one in terms of, of productivity. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, 557 species of, of bird food, 900 species nationwide. Um, there, there is no other plant genus that comes close to that in productivity. Here's the power of keystone oaks in, in my yard. 
Now I've, I've recorded, I've taken pictures of 1,031 species of moths. By the way, that's more species of moths in my yard than all the species of birds in North America. Uh, and again, I'm not through and I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, but out of the 1,031 species, 907 have known host plants. So there's still more than 100. I don't know what they're eating. Out of the 907, 267 species use oaks. Now we have 69 genera of native woody plants on our, our property. And only one of them is Quercus, the oaks. And we've got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks are supporting less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they're supporting almost 30% of our, our moth species diversity. So imagine what would happen if we took oaks out of this landscape. The diversity would crash. That's the role of a keystone plant. Where do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website and you put in your zip code and the rank list of both woody and herbaceous plants in your county will pop up. And they're ranked in terms of the number of species of caterpillars that they support in your county. And this is what a typical list will, will look like. Your list will look, be very similar to this. Um, oaks will be number one, followed by uh, native prunus, native cherries, willows. Now, I'm saying native because if you go to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, almost undoubtedly, they're going to sell you a flowering cherry from, from Asia. I want to buy a willow. They'll sell you the weeping willow from Turkey. Even if you say, I want to buy an oak, chances are you get a, a, a sawtooth oak, the Chinese oak, which is invasive, by the way you got to specify that you want a native member of these genera, because if you don't, you're going to have 65% fewer caterpillars. We've done that experiment. These are the, the uh, most important herbaceous genera uh, in, in most, most of the counties in this area. Goldenrod is always way up there. The various genera of asters are high uh, and our, our sunflowers in terms of supporting caterpillars, but also in terms of supporting our specialist bees. We want to plant for specialist bees because the generalists can use those plants as well. And if we don't plant for specialist bees, we lose them. You'll have generalists, but you, you, you'll lose all those specialists. So with solidago and, and asters and helianthus, that would give you more than 40 species of specialist bees that won't be there if you don't include them in your yard. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants, attract a lot of insects, particularly moths, to our yard, and we can have a vibrant food web, but then we're going to kill all those moths at our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. There's, there's research, particularly from Europe, which is uh, very convincingly suggesting that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect decline. We have lights on everywhere. It's killing insects by through exhaustion. They fly around, around, around until they just drop. They collide with the light. They get incinerated. They die of dehydration. The bat comes and picks them off. Bright lights blind uh, nocturnal insects a lot of the time. And it keeps them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. To me, this is actually really good news. Because if this, if we really have identified one of the major causes of insect declines, it's the easiest one to turn around. All you have to do is turn your light out. Flick of a switch. What could be easier than that? But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn my, my light out because uh, my security light out because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your security light so that only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to notice is the bad man does not come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to insects than our white wavelengths. And yellow LED lights are the least attractive. If we were to switch out our white, white bulbs, our white you know, porch light and, and uh, light over the garage and put in yellow bulbs overnight in the summertime, we would save billions of insects and billions of dollars too, because we'd save an awful lot of energy. All right, we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights and then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill all the insects that we've attracted to our yard. This is a booming industry around the country right now, undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. Now, Mosquito Joe will tell you uh, that it's okay because this is a natural product. It's a pyrethroid. You get it from chrysanthemums. And he's right, it's a natural product. He's wrong that it's okay. Um, cyanide is a natural product too. So that argument doesn't hold. He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes. That part's not even close to true. It kills all the insects it comes in contact with. The big thing is it doesn't work. 
if you, you don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the adults to get control. Mosquito Joe kills about 10% of the adults. So it doesn't work, it's expensive, and that's why Mosquito Joe has to come back and back and back. The way to control mosquitoes is in the larval stage. And here's a convenient thing that every homeowner can do. You get a bucket, you fill it full of water, you put in some straw or hay and let it ferment for a few days. It becomes irresistible to mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. Ovipositing mosquitoes, they lay their eggs in the bucket, then you get a mosquito dunk from the hardware store. You put in one of these discs in there. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium that attacks aquatic diptera and only aquatic diptera. So your mosquitoes will nibble on it, they will die. If you get a, larva, a dragonfly larva in here, it's not gonna hurt it. If your dog licks it, if the bird uh, uh, drinks out of it, not gonna hurt them at all. It only kills mosquitoes. Very targeted, it works, and it's cheap. Let's give it a try. Fourth thing we need to do is landscape in a way that allows our caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from the tree. Then it emerges as an adult, and uh, then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. And I wish that, that all the species did that, but most of them don't. 94%, 480 species that use oaks will, will complete their larval development and then drop from the tree as caterpillars and wiggle their way beneath, beneath the soil surface, pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree and we mow and compact our, our soils to the point where they're way too hard, the caterpillar can't get under there. So this becomes an ecological trap. Uh, it calls moths in with, with the right plants and they lay their eggs, the caterpillars drop down and they die. Uh, and of course the, the uh, cement landscape is even less of a viable option for, for caterpillars. And I'm not trying to discourage the use of, of trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of, of cement uh, as a default landscape. It destroys watersheds. It releases a lot of CO2. Cement is one of the major uh, releasers of, of uh, greenhouse gases. And of course, it's deadly to the, uh, to the caterpillars. It's just laziness. We can do better than that. This is what most people do though. They have a tree and a lawn. Nobody's measured the, how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they do better in a situation like this where you have a tree and then you have, you have a layered landscape. You can have a, a, a dogwood here, a native azalea, fern, ground cover. The caterpillar drops down to a safe site. The soil is loose. It can easily get underground. It can spin a cocoon in any leaves that are on there. Nobody's going to squish it by walking on it or mowing it. This is where you do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put big beds around your trees. Safe site. This is where you can use your, your ground covers like uh, wild ginger or may apple or foam flower or, or dozens of others or ferns. This is a uh, hotel in Athens, Georgia. Um, so even though it's middle of Athens, Georgia, these are red maple trees. Uh, any caterpillar that develops here can fall down to a safe site and actually make it. So how we treat the land under the, under the tree is um, I'm sure that right now that is a major cause of insect de declines, but we can easily turn that around. More research from another grad student, Desiree Narango, has, has uh, shown us that um, there really is room for compromise in our plant choices. She worked with chickadees, Carolina chickadees in the suburbs of, of Washington, DC, and she compared how sustainable chickadee populations are when a landscape is dominated by introduced plants versus uh, dominated by, by native plants. And the first thing she found is when they're dominated by introduced plants, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, the, the amount of bird food is reduced by 75%. Excuse me. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Each one of them had a, a, a nest box up, but the chickadees came and they, they said, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Uh, those clutches were 29%, almost 30% less likely to survive at all. Uh, those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings if they did survive, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that data into a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of woody non-native plants in your landscape, uh, this is what you get. 
this dotted line is the replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults uh, that die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, all this blue beneath the line here, that's a shrinking unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap very generously. Uh, and it suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass in your yard, non-native, as long as it's not invasive, uh, and still have viable uh, food webs in your yard. In other words, if, if at least 70% of your landscape is, is native plants, you can, you can support breeding birds. Um, if you have more than 30%, so if, you're, if your landscape is dominated by those non-natives and, and where Desiree worked, it was 58% non-native. Where I live, it's, it's 82%, yeah, 82% non-native. Um, then you're way down here. It's not, not even close to sustainable. But here's the area of compromise. Um, and, and I'm excited about this because it means you can have your ginkgo. You can have your camellias. You can have your boxwood, anything that's not invasive. Uh, and still have that viable food web, which to me is really good news because if my message was you can't have any non-native plants, I'd have very few people listening to me. Uh, we love our non-native plants. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It is the absence of native plants. So if we get these guys into the landscape, we can, we can tolerate a lot more of these. Can we use native plants uh, in formal designs? Of course we can. Uh, somebody sent me this this uh, developing uh, garden here in North Carolina. They're switching out uh, a lot of the non-natives for natives. Here's Joe Pye in here already. Notice I called it Joe Pye, not Joe Pye weed. It is not a weed. Uh, and the object is to make it entirely native in the same design. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in, in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a suburban yard like this without, without offending anybody? Of course we can, put a little fence around it. All of a sudden it's, you know, it's okay, it's culturally okay, but look at all the species that are here. Look at all the bees that it could, could service. It's not very big, um, but uh, if everybody did it, it'd be a lot more resource. Remember, you hear all the time, we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. That is a really anthropocentric view of why we need pollinators. And a lot of people think if they don't live next to a farm, they don't need any pollinators. Forget the crops. It's really about 12%, by the way. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinator, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not, not an option. Where do we need those pollinators? Every place we need plants including our yards. How about this design? It's much bigger. It's servicing a lot more bees. Uh, it's, still, it's still formally outlined. Um, it's not offensive. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of, of life that is here. It's a Drew Latham design, by the way. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are. I keep getting examples of this. Uh, Minnesota has a cost-sharing program try to convince people to reduce the area they have lawn. They pay you to replace some or all of your lawn with appropriate uh, Minnesota prairie plants. You get paid to do it. Pennsylvania, just learned about this last week. There's a lawn conversion program. You get up to 5,000 acres, $5,000 per acre to convert your lawn into a, uh, a natural area. What a great program. Florida is paying people. There's an island of Florida is paying people to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. So rather than punishing somebody because they, they use their yard if they've got a, a, an endangered species on it, you pay them to take care of it. Everybody would want an endangered species. There's a, a uh, bounty on calorie pears in uh, Missouri and in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. If you demonstrate that you've taken out a, a, a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Even water utilities or, or public utilities are getting in the act. You get a $100 coupon in San Antonio if you put in, in uh, water efficient native plants. You get a $100 coupon in Buffalo, New York, if you add natives. Uh, I think the motivation there is just to get more natives in the landscape. And then, of course, we've got the lung conversion programs in the far west, particularly California. $2 per square foot for every, every uh, square foot of, of lawn, thirsty lawn that you replace with xeric plantings. Very effective programs.
I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first misstep is that we have not we have not looked at nature as if it was essential. It's not that we don't like it. We like it, and some of us even think it's important, but, but very few of us think it's essential. So when, when push comes to shove, uh, nature always takes a back seat, you know, when resources are short, which is always. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there was this wall-sized poster there uh, that, that says, we need to save wildlife for future generations. And you know, I, I think that epitomizes what our society thinks of conservation. It's exactly what Teddy Roosevelt said. We need to create national parks so that future generations can appreciate how beautiful everything is. And I get that, that you know, that's true, but it suggests nature's there just for entertainment. It is far more important than that, folks. No wonder we think it's not essential. It's not just entertainment. We need nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. We talked about this, but if we restrict conservation efforts just to area where there are not a lot of humans, we're going to fail uh, because those areas are not big enough. David Quammen has a, a great uh, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That is 71 rug fragments, none of which are, are um, functioning as a Persian rug. And this is, of course, what we've done to our, our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests they're places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides. So what we need to do is glue our rug back together again with plants, but, but featuring those keystone plants. We're not just building biological carters that connects the viable habitats that remain out there. We're going to build viable habitat where there aren't any right now. So that plants and animals can live there, not just pass back and forth. And we're going to do that largely by favoring those, those keystone plants. In other words, we're going to start to share our properties with nature. We're going to all live together. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody on, on the planet bear the responsibility for good Earth stewardship? I have no idea. Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. Uh, we're, you know, you're not born with, with these mindsets, you're taught them. And we've been really good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to earth stewardship. It doesn't mean that we, you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. I love this approach because it empowers each one of us. You know, right now, so many of us feel totally powerless. The Earth's problems are huge. What can a single person do? Well, in this case, the, the cliche is, is, is right. A single person can make a difference, and you can see that difference. Go outside, shrink your lawn, plant that oak tree, put in your pollinator garden, get rid of your invasive species, and watch life come back to your yard. It doesn't take long, and it makes you an important cog in the future wheel of conservation. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable. Don't worry about the entire planet's problem. You will get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can, can fix. If you own property, it's obvious. That's, that's where you focus. And if everyone who owned property uh, in, you know, improved the ecological integrity of our, our yards, we'd be 85% done. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded, understaffed. They'll love you. <clears throat> so as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. Now, I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. Hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ptolemy. I just, I just love listening to you and feeling inspired um, because we can all make, make such a big difference. 
Uh, if you have a question for Doug, please add it to the Q&A panel that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and right now I'm gonna turn it over to Peggy uh, to share the questions that we have received or some of the questions we have received. Regretfully, we won't be able to get to all the questions, but we have targeted some to ask uh, Dr. Ptolemy. You can call me Doug. Doug, thank you, Doug. <laughs> So um, Peggy or... Um... I'm sorry, here I am. Oh sorry. yeah, no problem at all. That's okay. Um, we just have so many questions and I'm sorry, we won't be able to get to everybody's, but I'm sure they will all be asked at, you know, after this uh, presentation. So I think a very first one though is um, some of them are beginner questions and asking, you know, where do we begin? If we have a small yard, what are our where on earth would we start um, with changing our landscape from mostly exotics to natives? So Doug, do you have a suggestion on where to just begin? Uh, yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, I, I think the easiest thing would be to simply add a tree and of course make it the right tree, but it's, it, it's easy to plant a tree. And I recommend planting it young, planting it small so that it gets a chance to build its rootstocks Forget the instant gratification. Don't spend $3,000 on a 15 foot tree that has a 50% chance of, of dying. Um, get a little, little, little teeny one and it will grow and it'll be a lot healthier and a lot, lot cheaper. That's easy to do. Then you can start building a bed around that tree. That'll shrink the area you have in lawn. Um, when one of your non-natives dies, that's obvious. You, you replace it with something that, that is, is uh, you know, more powerful. Uh, but, you know, uh, before the, the, the virus, I would go all around and give talks and, and I'd hear people say, oh, I'm going to go home and rip out all my lawn. Don't do that. You've got to have a plan. Do it, do it slowly. Make it a hobby. This, is, this doesn't have to happen overnight. Um, and it's not, you know, it's, you can change it all the time. This is what gardeners do. They change things, see what works, what doesn't work. The, the overall goal is to increase the percentage of natives on your property. Now, if you do have invasive plants in your property, like if you have a whole row of burning bush, if you have barberry, if you've got a calorie pear, that's also easy to, to target. You want to get rid of those guys because they it's really like releasing smallpox spores on your on your property. It's just a terrible idea. Um, then, of course, once you if you chop down that calorie pair, what are you going to put in, it, in its place? So, you know, these are things you want to think about. But before next fall, when that calorie pair starts to make more berries, you want to get rid of that guy. Exactly. A lot of other questions are what resources are out there to help make those correct choices? Well, that's that's why I, I showed you that native plant finder, because that will will show you the plant genera that you can target, you know, which ones are going to going to be the most productive for, for where you live, which species you choose from within those genera really depends on your soil type and and, uh, you know, exactly where in the county you live. Um, your, your Native Plant Society uh, can help you a lot with those types of, of choices. Uh, but you know, there's an awful lot of information on the web these days that can, can guide you uh, in that regard. We've, it's so much better than it was 10 years ago where people not only couldn't find the plants, they didn't know what plants to look for. And it was pretty easy to give up. Um, but now there's a lot of resources out there. There are. And I think if people just take the time to surf and also, I'll be honest, the back of your books are great resources. As well. <laughs> yeah, you could do that there. too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I use them all the time myself at Maymont. Yeah. Yeah. Another question they have is the timing of mowing and cutting things down, particularly this time of year. Here we are in March. Many of us have perennial borders and we're encouraging others. Don't cut, don't cut. But when do we cut? When do we change that over from one season to the next? Giving you yeah. know, a nod to the importance of the insects that are lying within. Right. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated. So if you have a perennial border or something and it's in the front yard, you have to neaten it up. You, you, know, you have to do that. That's very different from the way you should treat a, a two acre meadow. So first we'll do the, the perennial border. Um, there can be. Uh, a, a lot of insects overwintering in what looks like dead, dead stalks. So uh, many of them are, are bees and Heather Holm has found that most of the bees that 
that do spend the winter and use those stems for places to reproduce, do it within the first two feet of the ground. So if you have a, you know, a four foot uh, goldenrod stem or something, you can cut it off without fear of injuring anything that's, that's in there. Uh, it's good to wait till this time to, to uh, cut down those plants because remember the seed heads were, were supporting your birds all winter long, particularly the sparrows and juncos, the things that don't go to our feeders. Uh, but Heather has also found that it's a little bit more complicated than we thought because the bees that are gonna use those stems use them the following year. So, so something that grew last summer and just overwintered, you, you, that's gonna be the resource that they will use this coming summer. So if you cut it down now, they still can't use it. So uh, what a lot of people are, are playing around with, I don't think anybody's actually studied it, but I don't see why it wouldn't work, is cutting them down low because you gotta do that, but then tying them in a bundle like those corn stalk uh, decorations and maybe putting them, excuse me, putting them in the back and stand them up so they don't fall down and rot. They should be usable by uh, a lot of the things that, that do use them. So I, I, I you know, really should test that officially, but um, that makes sense to me. Now, if you have a, a real meadow that's bigger than that, the standard recommendation is you want to, people say, I've got to mow it or I've got to burn it or it won't stay in meadow. We well, only mow or burn a third each year which means any one year, um, two thirds are untouched. People who mow or burn every single year are really clobbering the life in that, that meadow. So if you only mow one third, the two thirds that are untouched will recolonize the area that you did mow. Now let's say, well, you're gonna, we're gonna get invaded with the woody plants. Uh, and that's true. They constantly want to invade in this area. So you'd spot treat those woodies just go out and spot treat them in the area you did not mow or burn. And by the way, mowing and burning doesn't control the woodies anyway. It just sets them back. You want to kill the rootstock so that they're really gone. So if you have a larger meadow, that's, that's the recommendation. That's a very good recommendation. And I think it's one that we can easily follow. Another question is about lawns. Um, so many people, you know, our neighbors and our friends and, and ourselves included, you know, have these large lawns and you had said you purchased your home and it too had a large lawn. Where well, it was mowed for hay. It had no lawn, but it was, <laughs> yeah, right. It was a pretty, it was a monoculture, okay. It was a monoculture, right, yeah. Where did you start in, you know, to what degree or to what percentage of that lawn did you initially remove? It's one of our questions. Well, I, I will say that um, you can't use our house as a good example because we're in a long flag lot and nobody can see us. So we are not under the social pressure that most people who live right in the street are. So it's, we're a bad example. But um, again, you, you wanna reduce the area of that lawn by putting the plants in. So uh, I would add the plants and remove the lawn from the places you did. Now, my son bought a, a, a house um, about two years ago. And the first fall, he called me up and he said, he said, dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with the leaves? I said, put them in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. That's how you reduce your lawn. You know, don't, you know, if you put a heavy leaf load on, on a part of your lawn, it's going to kill the grass. And it's a great way to start to prepare that area to, to put plants into. Um, but I, you know, people are busy these days. I realize we can't go out and spend three months planting in our yard right away. So just pick at it. Uh, you don't have to reduce that lawn overnight. You do want to keep enough lawn that you have those cues for care that your neighbors are not going to get mad at you for. So uh, a mower's width of lawn along the sidewalk or along your, your driveway is always, it, it shows that what you're doing is intentional. You're still maintaining that. You can change your, your lawn instead of in a, uh, what does Thomas Rayner say, instead of a wall-to-wall a, a -wall carpeting, make it an area rug. Uh, and that's the way it should function so that you can, you can walk through it and, and appreciate the other things that are in your yard. But right now, the, the people with acres of lawn around me, I never, and I mean never, see them out in it. Who would want to go out there? It's a, it's a biological desert. You probably wouldn't come back alive. That's very true. And I need to mention that um, one of our viewers here was saying that Virginia does have a VCAP program that pays people to take up lawn and plant natives. Oh, no, I didn't know about that one. Assembly. 
Oh, so somebody could send me an email about that. I want to get the details on that. I didn't know about that. I'm sure you will be receiving one. Okay. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, we've got, hang on. It's very hard to slide things through here and keep up with it. The other question people were asking is when you're choosing a native, are you choosing a native plant to the region or are you really being um, thinking of the eco region, the native plant that is truly native to that specific region? <clears throat> Where I live, I just had a um, meadow, to be honest, designed for me. And we went right to the plants that were truly native to the site that I live in. And so when you're choosing your plants, do you consider that or are you trying to just have people be more broad? Ideally, sticking to your bioregion is a good idea. And, and you can get different levels of bioregions. I, I always look at level two. If you look up level two bioregion on the, on the web, it'll show you a map. And, but still, most of those are, are quite large. They cover uh, significant areas. Now, many plants will live in multiple bioregions. So for example, if I wanted to plant a white oak, they live in a number of bioregions. It's not out of their range to plant a white oak. Um, it, no, matter, you know, where you would, no matter where you live, particularly east of, east of the Mississippi. Um, but you don't want to violate uh, plant provenance. The, the uh, genetic adaptation that that species has made to your particular area over the, the eons. So for example, if I, uh, American beech grows from Canada to Florida and all the way west to, to the Mississippi. An insect that's going to eat American beech will eat a beech leaf from any of those places. It doesn't care, but you gotta have the beech living in your yard. Uh, I, I, there was a nursery going out of business in New Jersey years ago, and they had a lot of plants for sale really cheaply. So uh, Cindy and I drove up there and they had like seven beech trees uh, that were, you know, they were not expensive. We stuffed them all in the car. We bought them and came home and planted them. The following spring, they leafed out about four weeks too early. <laughs> and then we got, we got a frost and it, it, you know, stripped them of all the leaves. Several of those have died, but I had to put, you know, blankets over them to try to protect them. I'm sure that the seeds of those beaches had come from way down south. I didn't think of that because I bought them in New Jersey, but um, I violated the provenance of that, that genotype. You want to get a, a beach from your general area, and mostly you're talking about the latitude so that it can handle the cold if you're living in a mountainous area, it's got to be able to handle the, the elevation as well. That's more important than trying to preserve the food web because food webs are huge. They really are. We had one person ask, you know, what is the purpose of birds within that food web? The purpose? Well, or where does it fit <laughs> in? Um, birds are, are, you know, they're predators. They are, they are major. A lot of people worry about the insects defoliating their, their plants. Insects have a tremendous reproductive potential. Uh, so they, they lay hundreds of eggs each. But remember, the birds are eating hundreds every day per individual. So they're a major control of our, our, our insects. If you were to remove all the birds and had no other insect predators out there, they would explode. And that would be a huge problem. They were talking about balance in our trophic levels. You, the first trophic level are plants, the second are the herbivores, but then you've got uh, several trophic levels of predators and parasites and parasitoids that help keep all those things in check. And then of course there's predatory birds that eat the smaller birds. And, but all of those species are important in, in keeping that ecosystem chugging along. You don't wanna lose any of them. Well, then we have another question who sent in a um, query about an oak and they're, you know, of course we're having some problems with oaks and they're really uh, being pushed to treat their oaks in a broad, you know, broad spectrum manner. And their concern is they're killing all the insects to save the oak, but we need the oak, you know, it's the chicken and the egg. You know, how do you, um, what are your thoughts on this and dealing with some of the stresses of uh, introduced insects as well as uh, an overabundance of native insects that are kind of off, um, I'll say, 
off, off balance, we'll call it, for lack of a better word. Okay, that's a huge question. Before I get there, I want to jump back to birds and say they're also major dispersers of plant seeds. So uh, birds are the mechanism by which these seeds are getting around, and that's a real important ecosystem function. Okay, what about the oaks? Uh, yeah. back, back to seeds. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to fit everybody's in. Um, do you know of any reliable seed sources for native plants here on the East Coast? Um, Ernst Seed in Pennsylvania. Uh, there, you know, there's there's a, a couple of prairie moon nursery and prairie nursery in in the Midwest. But a lot of times they will collect seeds from um, you know outside. They'll tell you, well, I got it from Pennsylvania or New York or something. So that that you can maintain the provenance if you say, I really am looking for some some East seeds. Other than Ernst in the East, I know they exist. I just don't know what they. Somebody somebody here tonight will tell you where you can get seeds. Somebody's going to be selling seeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's Atlantic too, Atlantic Seed Company. So okay, good, good, good. Google and keep looking. But back to our oak right, now. Back our to the oak questions. Oak. Um, oaks have are we have we have introduced a bunch of diseases for oaks. Uh, where I live and and probably in Virginia too, you've got oak leaf scorch, which is hitting the red oak group quite hard, killing yeah. a number of red oaks, but not universally. Uh, so on my property, I've got two red oaks that are dying. The rest are, are making it. They're, they got it and they're recovering. They're going to make it, which illustrates a very important property here. We want to select for the resistant genotypes in our, our population. So people say, well, don't plant any more oaks because they've got diseases. Um, you'll never get resistance then and you've lost a vital component of our forest. So I, I never suggest we want to plant more oaks than ever so that we can find which ones are going to make it. Um, so I, I've gotten a number of emails recently. You know, you go farther west, there's oak wilt and the white oak group. And so they do have, they do have these problems. But so now we have, um, uh, I don't know what they are, you know, tree service companies <clears throat> who are saying, you need to treat for this, this, and this, this, in case these diseases come. So it's, you know, we're, we're treating even though you don't have the problem yet. Um, that's, you know, that's spraying by the calendar, not, not by the, the problem. And that is exactly what we've done in agriculture for, for a long time. Uh, it leads to uh, resistance of both the diseases and, and the insects. Uh, but of course, they get to charge you for it all the time. And that's why they're recommending that. So I would never treat for anything I don't have, uh, just in case it might come. Um, wait till there is a problem. You don't want to lose your 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 oaks to uh, a disease, but if it's obvious that that um, you have a really susceptible oak, all right, you're going to lose it and put in one that that uh, won't be so susceptible. Now that's a different approach to something like gypsy moth, which is not a disease. It's an introduced insect, of course, that that when it explodes can really clobber many of the the oaks, um, and it is worth it to treat for a temporal temporary problem like that because gypsy moth populations go up and down. I know Virginia had problems years ago. Right now, New England's having some resurgence. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, there were 20 or 30 years where they were very, very low. So um, it is worth treating when they're outbreaking. Uh, but yes, when you, when you spray BT, for example, uh, to get gypsy moth, you're killing all the lefts on that oak and you've just wiped out all the bird food in your, your area. So there are, there are problems with bringing in these, these non-native insects. And just to translate, lefts are lepidoptera, which are caterpillars. Sorry, yes. Sorry, yes, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You fell into your lingo. Well, then we have uh, two yeah. questions concerning woodlands to keep it moving along. One of them is, uh, if you own a woodland lot, is it wise to introduce native species like a middle layer with shrubs or the understory layer with smaller trees um, or to just leave it as it is? Many woodland lots here in Virginia are filled with very tall you know, canopy trees and that are so dense, very little grows underneath. Right, again, a lot in that question. First of all, uh, a lot of the, Woodlots that grew up when we pulled land out of farming way back in the 20s and 30s uh, are really dominated by tulip trees. Tulip trees are very good colonizers. So it's very easy for me to go into Maryland and Virginia and find a tulip tree monoculture. Very few other species because that's what came in. It's a, it's a forest. It looks great, but it's a single species. 
And you know, tulip trees support 21 caterpillar species, oaks support 557. So it's a good native, but it's sure not the best native. And if you can diversify that woodlot with those more powerful plants like black cherry, like uh, some of the oaks, um, like the beeches, you know, soon we may have uh, American chestnut that we can actually get back and think, then that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, would, would you have to open them up a little bit to do that? Possibly. Another thing that, that uh, we're learning, when I say we, I, I mean smart people, um, is realizing what it was like maybe 10,000 years ago, which is not long ago, believe me when we had the huge Pleistocene mammals were here. There were three species of Macedon in Mexico. Uh, we had giant sloths that, were, that could reach up 23 feet um, and, and herds of, of, of uh, giant bison. I mean, there were, these mammals were everywhere and they were eating a lot of vegetation. And the closed woods that we think are natural now were not closed. They were much more open and savanna-like and those big mammals kept them that way. Um, those mammals psh, disappeared, i.e. humans came and killed them all. That's most of the evidence suggests that now. And that just drastically changed the way our plants grow to what we now think, oh, that's the way they want to be. Well, they, for you know, a long, long time, they weren't that way. So having a more savanna-like uh, landscape where there is more sunlight, the prairie plants we see in the Midwest came all the way to the east and they were, they were underneath our plants. So the diversity of plants and life in our Eastern forest was far higher back then than it is now with all the with the loss of light. So um, don't feel bad about taking out a tulip tree here or there uh, when you've got an awful lot of them and try to get some of those other ones in there. Another very important part of that question though is you probably don't have much understory because you've got way too many deer because we all have way too many deer and those deer eat the natives and leave the non-natives. So it, it, they're a major cause of the um, invasive problems that we have our native plants are actually quite competitive, but not when you throw deer in there. The baby oak pops his head above the ground, the deer eats it, and it won't touch the autumn olive. So who's going to win? Mm. Um, so that's often the understory, and that's a function of too many, too many deer. But you're right that the typical understory plants in a healthy forest are the young canopy trees that are just waiting for the light gap so they can, they can uh, jump. We don't have that many native shrubs, really. We've got the viburnums and witch hazels and, and a few others, but not that many. I'm a person who looks for silver linings and dark clouds, and I think of EAB, Emerald Ash Borer, as a dark cloud. Um, but could a silver lining to this horrible infestation um, be that it might thin some of our forests? And if so, how should we react to you know, our situation? Because there's many you know, ghost trees that are along the East Coast now. Yeah, um, it could be. You're working hard to make that a silver lining, though. Yeah, the, the, I stretch things. <laughs> because the other problem with uh, really opening things up rapidly is what do you think comes in first? It's all those invasive species. So if you manage them, if you keep the multiflora rose out and the autumn olive out and the, you know, the burning bush and all those guys, the bush honeysuckle and the privet, which is big as you move further south, um, good, then that's an opportunity, but they're going to be the ones that want to come in. So it's going to be a lot of management. Plus ash is a really, you know, it's important tree. There are 95 species of insects that depend on ash and they'll all disappear if we lose our ashes. So I can share personally at Maymont, we are injecting our ashes every year. Um, we're injecting every ash tree we have on the 100 acres and I encourage others to do the same. Um, because it does come as a wave, the wave will pass and you know, it's like with any wave, we'll have some remainder. But if we can get our trees through that initial wave, we might be able to get them all the way. There's also uh, some, some um, notable successes in, in trying to bring in uh, biocontrol parasitoids for emerald ash borer. It's, it seems like it's starting to work. And one, one study, they get up to 80% control. So that's good news. It's very good news. Um, we're going to switch topic because we're getting a lot of questions about this. People are asking about the brood um, of cicadas that's coming our way, particularly up in the D.C. area. And I think maybe up where you live in the Philly yes. area. Yes, yes. Um, what are your thoughts on that and affecting new plantings? Um, are you continuing or are you, you know, from an entomological stance, sir? I, I rely on your expertise here. Well, to me, it's a very exciting event. I mean, it happens once every 17 years. So, you know, this very well may be the last one I ever see. And um, so I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, 
what's it going to, you know, we call it, we call these, these uh, 17 year cicadas nature's pruners because they do, they lay their eggs in thinner uh, terminal twigs that often causes dieback from that point on. You get flagging. Uh, and, you know, some people get very upset about that, but um, most trees can handle it just, just fine. Uh, it can be an issue if you have a very heavy emergence and you plant a, a young tree. Um, because if they do that on all the branches of the young tree, what that really says is you don't have enough big trees and they're just looking around for something, something to, to hit. But um, that can be an issue. And uh, so if there was ever a time when you were going to, if you're choosing, should I plant a tree in the spring or should I plant a tree in the fall? I would choose the fall this year uh, because you will dodge, you will dodge them and you won't have to worry about it for 17 more years. And at that point, your tree would be big enough to be able to handle it. Yeah, so little pruning of mature trees are fine, but it's the young ones, they can really be affected. Um, right. I wanted to share that the Virginia Department of Forestry does provide a grant program for treating your ash trees, okay? Okay, so, great, yeah. Anyway, Virginia's got it together, we really do. We go to, I have a, a simple question here um, concerning mulch and you're promoting ground covers, but is mulch a, a substitute until the, you know, what do you feel about putting mulch down? Because many of the insects that we don't think about need bare soil as part of their life cycle. Well, bare soil is not good. The only insects I can think of that need bare soil um, are little patches for some of our ground nesting bees, uh, because then they like to, to, to tunnel down. But um, that we're not talking about bulldozer sized patches here. Bare soil means, means uh, the soil dries out and the soil fauna uh, uh, there are more species that live in the soil than above the soil. They all have to go deep to avoid that, that desiccation. It, it encourages uh, soil erosion. So um, there's typically enough bare soil that you don't have to worry about creating it. But uh, the perfect mulch in nature is the, our leaves. I know mm. people go out and they buy, they buy heavy bark mulch and everything. And, and uh, that's better than bare soil. It, it really is. But um, mulching a big area is really just a weeding opportunity because the weeds will come up through that anyway. That's why the, getting those ground covers in or those, those uh, you know, the layered landscape that where you can't even see the ground, that is the way to avoid weeding and to have healthy soils is to have it very well planted. You know, and we have, never, never do the volcano vulches, vulches with, with, uh, you know, with the wood chips. I still see that all the time. Yes, yes. How to kill a tree in one easy step. Put a lot exactly. of mulch in the bark. <laughs> right, right. Um, we do have a lot of questions about people mm -hmm. asking, how can we get this message out to HOAs, to our community, to our neighbors, to our, our, our neighbors who just love their lawn? You know, what are your tools that you can offer us to help spread this word of the importance of natives and incorporating them into our landscapes? You know, for years, I have been recommending that you infiltrate your, your HOA, change <laughs> from within. Um, and you do that by, by, I mean, these rules are created by people. We're people. We can, we can join there and, and use logical arguments. Um, it's really why I write the book so that we can lay out the argument uh, so that people can, can try, to, try to change. But I heard a story just, it was probably two weeks ago of where it really worked. Somebody did exactly what I suggested. They joined their HOA, they read them the book, the HOA changed all the rules and now they're, they're uh, demanding that everybody have at least 70% native woody plant biomass on their yard. In the HOA, the HOA is saying this. I said. Wow, that worked. <laughs> so do it. <laughs> uh, I just want to point out we're approaching 815. And um, I know that I, I really value your time, um, Doug. Uh, we've gotten a couple hundred questions. <laughs> we can't get through them all. I know you'd be happy to stay on and, and, and answer them all, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I... Um, I, you know, I want to get your feel for how many more you'd like to. I can go another 15 answer. minutes. How about that? Another 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. My next one is nativars. It's a great, great question. Cultivars of native plants. And I personally have heard you answer this one before. 
Um, but we have three or four questions on what um, the use of native virus, how do they affect insect populations and pollinators? Right. You know, if you go to the nursery and say I want a native plant, chances are really good they're going to sell you a cultivar of a straight species because that's mostly what what's there. So that's a good question. Is that as effective as a straight species? And the answer is it depends on what the genetic trait was that was changed to create the cultivar. We did an experiment that was uh, funded and sponsored by Mount Cuba Center. Uh, looking at that question for six of the common cultivar traits that are, are used in, in woody plants, like taking a green leaf and making it red or purple, uh, adding leaf variegation, making a tall plant short, enhancing berry size, introducing disease resistance. Those are the types of traits we looked at. We didn't look at any flower traits. Uh, and the only trait that consistently discouraged insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple, because that loads the leaf with anthocyanins, which are feeding deterrents. Um, the disease resistance didn't impact the, the insects at all, so that was good news. Uh, Annie White at the University of Vermont did her PhD looking, looking at what happens when you do flowers. And there the, the, the news wasn't quite so good because as soon as you start to change flower traits, you're messing with those that very specialized interaction between the flower and the specialist bees that depend on that flower. And I should say the plant depends on the specialist bees too, because they are the best at moving the pollen. They're much better than the generalist bees or all those other flower visitors that take pollen but don't move it at all. Um, so it, it's not universal though. There are examples where the cultivar actually did a better job supporting the, the pollinators. So it really, the answer is it does depend. But when you're, when you take an, an echinacea and you make it look like a zinnia, um, that's not going to help the, the, the pollinators. Or if you take the uh, hydrangea and uh, arborescens, which is the native hydrangea and Make it Annabelle. That's the cultivar that's always sold. That's a double flower where the reproductive parts of the of the flower have been turned into those white bracts, and it, it makes it much more showy as a as a hydrangea. But you've ruined the the pollinator function of that that plant. So you're always safest to get the the straight species. Um, and I would love to see nurseries sell more straight species as options so that if you are, are gardening for function, you have the option of, of buying that. Um, that's starting to happen a little bit, but it's going to happen faster if you go to the nursery and say, I want to buy this plant, uh, a straight species. And they say, well, we don't have that. Then say, OK, I'll come back when you do. Don't buy something else. That'll encourage them that there is a market for this and they'll start to carry it. Be aware that that cultivars, most of them are propagated clonally, which means there's zero genetic variability. And in the age of climate change, where we have such erratic climatic changes so quickly, we need as much genetic variability in our plants as possible so that they can uh, try to adapt to these things. It's genetic variability that permits adaptation. That's interesting. I have a question. One of the first ones of the night was for native plants, should we be looking more toward the plants that are for North Carolina, South Carolina, and a little in a zone further south than us um, because of the climate change? So um, right. what, what are you thinking on that thought? That's called assisted migration. And um, I would say, look what happened in Texas two weeks ago. That's exactly why we shouldn't do that because we still get, because of climate change, we're getting more erratic weather. It's not this gradual warming in a peaceful kind of way, it's wild swings. So you still get those polar, polar vortex coming down and, and uh, um, that freeze went all the way down into Mexico and any plant you move north would have been nailed. And that's still gonna have, it's gonna happen more frequently now as opposed to, to less frequently. So. No, I would I would go with the plants that belong where they are now and hope that the genetic variability allows them to, to pull through. Very good answer. I agree with that too. Um, another, I'm getting a lot of questions of plants that were good up next to the house. What are keystone plants for the shade? And you had mentioned the plant finder that you've put together. Um, is that still under construction? Is it a work in progress? <laughs> or is it <laughs> Um, you know, this is National Wildlife Federation, and they're always tweaking it. And the big tweak that's coming up now is to add actually, um, it's right now it's by county. Uh, we want to rearrange it so that it's it's by uh, ecoregion. It's going to make it easier to use. And we're going to add 
the keystone plants for pollinators so that you will know which plants are supporting the most specialist bees. Uh, and then there would be a third option where you say which plants are doing both the best. They're the most caterpillars and the most pollinators. A um, lot of talk about this. We've got the data. When they actually pull it off, I have no idea. I'm not in control of that at all. But that's that's coming down the, the pike. Um, what was the original question? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> the plant finder. <laughs> that's all it was. Because I okay. wanted to add in, too, that here in Virginia, we have the DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, and they have great resources here on native plants by coastal Piedmont or mountain region, which is our regions here in Virginia. And here's, here's, here's another plant. You know, uh -huh. this plant, you know, essential native plants, native trees and shrubs of eastern United States by Tony Dove and, and Ginger Woolridge. They have the most extensive charts at the beginning of their book that I've seen in any book. Uh, so that if you want to find out what a plant is doing, uh, whether it's good in the shade or anything else, that is the book to go to because uh, I, I have not seen that done better any, any place. So you're saying native plants of Eastern United States? Native trees and shrubs of Sorry. Eastern United States. I'm we writing also, it down. Oh, and we also in Virginia have, um, have produced uh, regional native plant guides based upon, yes. our, uh, upon our flora. And um, we have an online digital atlas of the flora of Virginia. Oh, great, um, yeah. And those, those, all those guides are actually downloadable from plantvirginianatives.org. Um, there's some really great resources and I have to pick up the book you just suggested as well, Doug, uh, myself. Um, so as you said, there are a lot of great resources out there and we can help point the way to those. Mm -hmm. And for those who want to pay a, a real copy, you can go to Lewis Ginter, you can go to Maymont, you can go to a number of locations throughout the state to get your regional plant guide. They are available in, uh, I'll say, hard copies for those who don't like to download things on the internet. So mm -hmm. it's great. So call your local garden, call your local uh, you know, master gardener office, and you will find these. They're out there. So... Um, Gosh, we're getting to really specific little questions that I don't know if we want to get into. Um, uh, uh, here's one from Miriam that I personally like. How do you see the native plant wildlife world intersecting with the regenerative agriculture permaculture world toward the goal of rebuilding functional ecosystems? Well, you know, agriculture uh, and to a lot of extent permaculture is about growing food. We have to do that. <laughs> yes. We're not going to get rid of agriculture. Permaculture can help you, you know, uh, grow food locally. Growing food locally is great. Uh, it reduces the the ecological footprint of of agriculture. So, but it's they're two different things. They're apples and oranges. Um, if you have a well planted native landscape where you are conducting permaculture or or you know have have uh, you know, big vegetable gardens, you will have. Um, you'll be supporting more natural enemies that will help control pests in those situations. Uh, so that, um, you know, that works really well. There's a, there's a great example from the, from the tropics, but it works up here as well, where um, the Guanacaste National Park, right outside it was a big orange grove. And Dan Jansen, who was running, created this park, paid the orange grower to not spray anything that season which, you know, for oranges, you don't do that. You got to spray a million times. And they said, I, I will buy all of your oranges. So you're not going to lose any money here. And he wanted to see whether the, the natural enemies in the forest could actually control the orange pests. The yield was higher without spraying anything because all the natural, uh, the, you know, the natural enemies, the predators and, and even uh, natural fungal parasites and things went in and controlled the, the pests in that that orange grove. Uh, that was a, just a great demonstration of what a, a and it was a national park, a really healthy ecosystem, but what it can do when you have pest problems. So if you have a super, you know, balanced native, native landscape and you start to grow some food in there, it will help with that as well. That's a good answer. I think people will have to understand too, if we can keep our plants healthier, that'll be a reduction in the, the number of pests that are drawn to it. Um, because it, it's a it's a reaction for the plants to send off sort of a signal and the pests come in to help finish it off. Um, it's just part of the, part of the web. 
And, and keep in mind, as soon as you spray something, the first things to die are the natural enemies. The last to die is the pests. So, and then you're in this the pesticide treadmill because you've knocked out your natural enemies, which means then you really have to spray and you never get out of it. So be aware yeah. of that. It's a challenge. Well, I have two questions that one of them is one that we love. That first slide that you showed with that beautiful yellow bird, it slipped by me very quickly. What bird is that? I should offer, I, I should pose that to the audience as a, as a test. But it's a trick. It's a trick test. That's a hermit warbler from the West Coast. Ah, my, ah my, that's why we couldn't figure it out. You some of my that. grandchildren live in Portland, Oregon, and that's where I took that picture in, in Oregon. So, uh, yeah, you won't see that here, but it's a pretty bird. So I put it up there. <laughs> There's a lot of activity on the texting over here of like, what is that bird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it jumps the best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another question is, um, you know, commercially available insects uh, such as meal mealyworms and such, you mm -hmm. know, versus the real thing. You know, what's your what's your take on those? Are they a substitute or are they a poor a poor man's substitute? Yeah, um, there are times when they can be a valuable addition. Uh, so if you have a cool wet spring. You're talking about mealworms in particular, which people put out and the birds eat. If you have a cool wet spring and it really knocked the caterpillar load down, it can be very hard on breeding birds. They often lose their first clutch because there's simply not enough to feed them. And if you put out a whole bunch of mealworms and you want to spend the money to do it, they'll take them and they'll use them and they'll probably bring that, that clutch through. But keep in mind, I mean, you, you probably didn't notice in my carotenoid chart there, mealworms are beetles and they have very few carotenoids. Mealworms are, you know, they're not eating green leaves. So, um, so it is food, but it's, if that's all they eat, it's not balanced. You just answered another question, sir. Thank you very much. So, okay. And the final question I'm going to ask is many people are asking, where can they find out when you're going to speak again? Because they would oh, love boy. to hear once again. And I know hopefully on your website, you have a list of, of Zoom. No. No, I'm going to speak again tomorrow. I speak every single day. <laughs> um, where is tomorrow? It's uh, Mad Gardeners in Connecticut. I'm going to I'm going to do the the restoring the little things that run the run the world talk. But um, I don't maintain it because it I can't I can't keep up with it. I need a dedicated <laughs> secretary to do that. It changes every single day. And I'm not kidding. There's a talk every day and I just can't keep up with that. I, 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 I can't finish my email. If I spent all my time managing my, my website, uh, I can't do it. So yeah, I know it'd be useful, but um, I'm sorry. I understand. <laughs> and can I ask the most unrelated question of the night? Do you know Joe Biden? <laughs> I met Joe Biden in 1982 when he, he was Joe Biden, but not the real Joe Biden. Um, it was an event in Delaware, you know, I'm at the University of Delaware and he, he was a politician, so he came by. Would he remember me? No, he would not remember me. Um, his daughter went to school with my son, but would, would he remember that? No, he wouldn't. So um, the answer is, yeah, but no. <laughs> he's got other things on his mind right now he i hope he does personally <laughs> well virginia i'm gonna pass it back over to you because i think you've exhausted this man and i just appreciate um personally i appreciate you taking the time to answer all these questions oh, sure. um, it's fun it's fun it absolutely um doug we have so thoroughly enjoyed this time with you and um, yes, thank you so much for staying on, staying with us another half hour to try to answer um, some, uh, you know, some more of those questions. Um, please know, uh, attendees are on the line, um, that we will try to get back to you with some answers to those questions after the webinar. Uh, and um, please also know that the webinar um, has been recorded and a link will be sent to you. Um, and ultimately, the uh, Doug's presentation will be available on plantvirginianatives.org. I saw a number of comments from attendees that um, they wanted to share this with their neighbors and in their communities. And please do. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what needs to happen. 
Um, so I just want to th say thanks again to Doug for starting our webinar series off with this great message of hope and, um, you know, that we can really make a difference by planting natives in our yards and by can building those connections between our properties and also with ourselves, um, amongst ourselves. So uh, please, uh, please spread the, spread the message um, and, uh, and thanks for, um, and thanks for to Doug again for the time tonight. You're welcome. <laughs> many, many thanks. And so with that, I wanna say good night and uh, many thanks to all of you out there for planting many Virginia natives. Hey, have a good weekend, everybody. You too. Bye-bye.